13, 2003, Cleveland, Ohio. 11-year-old Shakira Johnson attends a Saturday afternoon block party. The party is more of a memorial service for one of the local activists who had been killed a year earlier. The weather was beautiful, sunshine and temperatures near 80. The day was filled with typical activities you'd find at a block party, and of course, there was tons of food. From all accounts, from all the people that were there, Shakira had a good time and spent the day playing. Nobody knew that when Shakira left the party that day and headed home, that would be the last time she would be seen alive. Hello and welcome to episode 23 of Who Killed, a podcast that takes a deep dive into the cases that still haunt communities. I am your host, Bill Huffman, and join me this week as we discuss who killed Shakira Johnson. In September 2003, I was a student at Cleveland State University. I was lucky enough to have just started an internship with the news radio station in Cleveland, Ohio, WTAM 1100. The media and the internet at the time put a lot of pressure on the police to find Shakira, and a lot of questions were raised about why an Amber Alert had not been issued. During my time at WTAM, I was able to learn the business from Levon Putney, now of WCBS New York. And when we covered Shakira's case, we were able to cover it from pretty much the start because she disappeared on September 13th and the first real reports of a missing child came in about Sunday, September 14th and then the media really latched on that Monday, September 15th and that's when all the questions were raised about the Amber Alert. Shakira's case happened during the first two weeks of my internship at WTAM, so it was pretty common for us to attend press conferences, interview family members, and interview the commander of the 4th District Police, Michael McGrath. It was really a front row seat to one of Cleveland's more sad times. It was an eye-opener, too, for a kid from the suburbs. I realized quickly that there were certain stories that you had to approach differently and with a certain amount of sensitivity. Shakira's abduction and disappearance were heavily covered through each step of the investigation. The plane dealer stated at the time investigators worked under the, quote, harsh spotlight of media attention. While Putney and I were hitting the pavement, there was a whole other investigation taking place. An Amber Alert is something we have become accustomed to since it was first introduced in 1996 in Texas. We've all heard about cases where prosecutors and investigators become solely focused on one particular suspect. And in Shakira's case, this is definitely something that occurred. Daniel Hines, a quote-unquote self-employed repairman, was pretty much in the crosshairs of the investigation from the beginning of the disappearance. So much so that the police were able to convince a judge six days into the disappearance of Shakira that Daniel Hines needed to have his bond revoked for a previous and unrelated charge. Now, granted, the charge was for molesting a child, but... Nonetheless, they were able to convince this judge to revoke the bond, and they brought him into custody six days after Shakira had gone missing. So, without knowing that there was any physical evidence or DNA evidence or a body, even, investigators had focused in on Daniel Hines as the sole suspect in the case. Now, the community continued to search and continued to look for Shakira, but investigators, they very much zeroed in on Hines, and it was basically Hines or bust. And in this case, I feel like they could have done a better job of looking at other suspects, especially with the end result. So I'm going to run you through a quick little timeline here that uh, the plane dealer had put together at the time. 
regarding the case, and it's it's important to listen to because with Shakira's case, there was not a lot of information as far as what people had seen. She had been to a block party, yes. She had walked home, yes. But that was it. That's all anybody had known. And that was what the media had to work with. So when we would go and interview family members, it was more of what was she like? Who was she as a person? And explain to us how you think or who you think may have been involved in this case. And I will tell you that even the family members, I don't know if this was because of the investigators, but they focused in on Hines as well. Shakira's abduction and disappearance were heavily covered through each step of the investigation. The plane dealer stated at the time the investigation worked under the, quote, harsh spotlight of media attention. While Putney and I were hitting the pavement, there was a whole other investigation taking place. An Amber Alert is something we have become accustomed to since it was first introduced in 1996. The radio or television is interrupted, and a description of the missing child is relayed to the audience. So for one reason or another, there was no such alert when Shakira Johnson went missing. The authorities like to say that the criteria weren't met in her case, and therefore no alert was issued. However, only two weeks after she went missing, another girl on the east side of Cleveland actually disappeared, and an Amber Alert was issued in her case. And you may say, ah, they learned their lesson. But let's not forget Shakira was still missing. No one knows what would have happened if Shakira would have been treated the same way as Amanda Mulliken White. In a city where race has always been an issue, the fact that police issued an Amber Alert for a white girl from Cleveland Heights only created a little more divide. While Amanda was found safe and returned home, Shakira was still missing. Cleveland Heights Police Captain Michael Cannon told the Associated Press that the system worked this time. A girl was out late and possibly in danger. He added that his department would be reviewing their Amber Alert guidelines. When asked why he thought an alert wasn't issued for Shakira Johnson, just one city over, he declined to comment. Commander of the 4th District Police Michael McGrath was forced to defend his department's decision to not issue an alert. So again, why wasn't an alert ever made about Shakira? She was out late at night and possibly in danger? McGrath said the criteria were not met in Shakira's case, but even without an alert, his department had worked around the clock on her disappearance. He also said that an Amber Alert is something that needs to be issued within hours of the suspected abduction, and some idea of the child being in danger. McGrath went on to say that widespread media coverage, such as being on America's Most Wanted, would help find Shakira. Again, Shakira was still missing. The community rallied together as they formed search parties and passed out flyers. The Johnson family was a regular fixture on local news, pleading for any information about Shakira. The amount of community support for the Johnson family was overwhelming. As police and volunteers searched the city for weeks, it all came to a head when an anonymous tip told authorities to check a vacant lot on East 71st Street. It would be in this vacant field where the body of a small girl laid, decomposing from the elements. The body was in such bad shape that the coroner was going to need to perform an autopsy in order to determine whether or not this was Shakira. I'm going to go through a timeline that the Cleveland Plain Dealer put together in the year following Shakira's murder. It's kind of a precise, detailed version of pretty much what happened during that time. So it was on September 13th when 11-year-old Shakira Johnson was last seen at the block party on the east side. Her family actually pleaded with police to issue an Amber Alert, but again, they said it didn't fit the use of the system. Now, I did find one Ohio sheriff say that if you use the system too often, people will begin to ignore them. But again, he said this while Shakira was still missing. 
Three days later, classmates from Nathan Junior High School and volunteers searched the area for any signs of Shakira. And on this day, it was the first of several rallies and searches and other shows of public support. A day after the searches began, Khalid Samad, a city worker and neighborhood activist, was actually accused of helping drag a fugitive rapist from an east side home while hunting for Shakira. He has since denied the accusation. On September 18th, dozens of motorcyclists from several groups rallied and held a candlelight vigil. The area near Shakira's home is turned into a makeshift shrine for the girl, and her picture is put up on poles and windows. While police were investigating, the FBI was also brought in to assist. They cover kidnappings, so they were assisting in this case from the start. And 11 days into Shakira's disappearance, her mother, Alyssa Randall, voluntarily took a polygraph test to end investigators' repeated questioning of her and her family. The investigation appeared to be picking up steam on September 25th when authorities came into Shakira's neighborhood and arrested several sexual predators that had been wanted on search warrants. They also searched two homes, one on East 106th Street and Benham Avenue, and the other on East 108th Street, north of Union Avenue. Now, the same woman, who neighbors say is a longtime resident, actually owns both houses. So this is where things get really interesting. This woman actually turned out to be the mother of Daniel Hines. He was the self-employed repairman who authorities actually zeroed in on right after Shakira's disappearance. On September 29th, one day before Amanda White went missing, police defended the use and application of the Amber Alert. They claim, again, the alert was not used in Shakira's case because its criteria were not met. For about two weeks, things died down a bit. The case was obviously still being worked, but there wasn't much news at the time to report. Levon Putney and I would go wherever the latest news about the case was being released. The hope the community had was beginning to fade a bit. October 14th was the day charges were dismissed against several people, including Samad, who was accused of vigilante-like acts during a search in September, and clues for Shakira's disappearance. And then it was on October 15th when all hell breaks loose. Police received the anonymous tip that leads them to a body of a child in a vacant lot. The following day, the Cuyahoga County coroner said the small, decomposed body found in a weedy field near East 71st Street was probably that of missing 6th grader Shakira. Now, an article from The Plain Dealer on October 16, 2003 says, quote, The family of 11-year-old Shakira Johnson will have to wait a little longer to learn whether the de decomposed body found yesterday by police is the little girl who's been missing since September 13th. Cuyahoga County Coroner Dr. Elizabeth Balraj said the autopsy will help her make a probable determination about whether the body in the field next to an abandoned warehouse was actually Shakira's. But she did say that it would take several days before the DNA tests would be returned. So they used material from Shakira's toothbrush and hairbrush for comparison. And she did say that she was unable to match dental records with Shakira because Shakira had actually never been to a dentist. So it's one of those situations where you can see a divide in class, whereas Shakira did not have the options that some of the people that live in the suburbs in Cleveland have, and growing up where she did, she was limited in the resources that were given to her. So while many people in Shakira's neighborhood uh, presume the body was hers, uh, police were not going to jump to any conclusions. Commander Michael McGrath, he did head a 40-member team investigating the disappearance, and he did tell uh, the press that detectives and agents would continue working the investigation until identification is actually positive. 
and at that time, the case would be turned over to the police department's homicide division. The discovery was prompted by an anonymous call to police, and it was just one of such calls that they would receive on any given day. Police searched for clues at the site, which was just about two miles from where Shakira lived. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I know what it's like to lose a child, because obviously I don't. And I'm sure the experience is different for everyone. But in Shakira's case, her disappearance led her mom to have a quote-unquote religious awakening. Alyssa Randall was baptized at Harvest Baptist Church on East 93rd Street. And I'm going to quote Reverend A.F. Caver from that day. Quote, no matter what they did to the body, the spirit was taken. All they had was flesh. God knew evil was coming and snatched the spirit away from the flesh. Before and after the ceremony, Randall clapped, sang, and smiled with about 80 adults and uh, about two dozen children in the regular Wednesday night service. Joe Seals, Shakira's grandfather, had said earlier that the family had never given up hope that the girl, last seen leaving the block party at 106th Street, would actually come home. And hopes remained real as tests still were underway. The coroner said the body was so badly decomposed that it would take a full autopsy to determine whether or not it was Shakira. Have you ever wondered about things that go bump in the night? Or objects in the sky? Or other things you just couldn't explain? Then join me, Jim Mallard, on my podcast, The Mallard Report. Each week, you'll find engaging conversations with guests who are authors, historians, and scholars who lend their expertise as we discuss current events and venture into the fringe and paranormal. The Mallard Report hits controversies head-on, yet remains conversational, and can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any other major podcast platform. So, she actually ends up saying, quote, At this point, I cannot say if it is a black or white, male or female, only that it is a small person. In a statement to reporters and residents at East 71st Street and Etna Road, Cleveland Police Chief Ed Lawn said police were searching, quote, meticulously, but he never mentioned the name Shakira and ignored any questions about the case. As the family watched and waited for results, Mayor Jane Campbell went to Shakira's home and prayed with Miss Randall to fulfill a promise that she would tell her personally if there was a development in the case. Mayor Campbell said that Randall was showing, quote, great strength that she had asked people to pray for Shakira and the family. The mayor's car picked up Shakira's brothers from Nathan Hale Middle School and brought them home. When school let out, just before 2 p.m., teachers actually walked the children past Shakira's house and made sure they did not bother the family. A spokesman for the family members said they needed to be alone to pray. Members of Truth Ministries, one of several religious and community groups that searched day and night for Shakira, gathered at the scene and prayed with residents. That evening was emotional for the volunteers and church members who had exhausted all of their energy in trying to bring this 11-year-old girl home. Many of the people that night broke down in tears knowing the worst-case scenario was probably amongst them. Some of the people in attendance that night said they had searched where the body was found, and they just couldn't understand how they could have missed it. A common refrain from the people involved in the search was they never gave up hope. Shakira's stepfather returned several times to where her body was found, and he stood with the community activist at the time, Art McCoy. They looked on as investigators walked and searched through the field. It was also a very scary time for residents, as they felt like the killer could have been anyone in the community. And just a quick warning, the next 10 seconds are pretty graphic, so I just want you to skip ahead if you aren't comfortable with descriptions of uh, terrible things. So, the next step in the process was determining if Shakira had been sexually assaulted. Decomposition had left some bones exposed and separated the head and legs from the torso. The Shakira disappearance rocked the community. 
needless to say. But it did bring residents citywide together in search for the girl. Activists had rallied to keep her name in the news, and even had a profile of Shakira appear on America's Most Wanted. People gathered together after the coroner's ID near the warehouse where Shakira was found. People placed red and yellow carnations, pink roses, stuffed animals, balloons, and other items on the chain-link fence that enclosed the abandoned field. Somebody even placed a Bible along the candles with rosaries and a card stating how much they'll miss her. As has been stated, the community really came together to find Shakira, and the same support was there after the body was found. The community activist, Khalid Samad, who had been accused of vigilante justice, spoke at Shakira's funeral. He told the mourners in attendance that, quote, she was martyred, not murdered. Shakira's funeral drew a huge crowd and maxed out the capacity of the church. People came in all sorts of different modes of transportation, such as cars, motorcycles, public vehicles, and private buses. They entered the church until the pews and the chairs were full. People even watched from the basement on closed-circuit television or stood outside and listened to loudspeakers. Councilman Zachary Reed said, quote, Look at what this little girl has done. She has brought this community together. Shakira's mother left the funeral holding a single white carnation as a picture of her daughter remained posted on the screen. Children from her school, Nathan Hale, gave teddy bears to the family and carried flowers outside. People lined part of East 71st Street and Woodland Avenue with many holding signs as they shouted Shakira's name while the procession moved by. The crowd chanted, Shakira, Shakira, and a procession of cars a mile long wound through Lakeview Cemetery. Members of those 16 motorcycle groups I mentioned before joined the police escort. Shakira's mother met the family near the grave, but she couldn't stay. The grief was too much, and she spent most of the service in the limousine. A dozen white doves were released, and the shouts earlier turned to whispers as Shakira, Shakira. The doves circled, then disappeared. Alyssa Randall's sons, her husband and Shakira's father, Russell Williams, joined community activists in lo lowering the coffin and shoveling dirt onto it. Shakira was no longer missing. Let's run through the next part of the story because this is when police show their cards. On October 16, 2003, the Cuyahoga County coroner said the decomposed body was that of Shakira's. And then four days later, the test confirmed that. Then on October 25th, Shakira Johnson's funeral was held. As I mentioned, she was buried at Mount Sinai Baptist Church on Woodland Avenue. Now, fast forward 23 days, and it was on November 17th that Daniel Hines was arrested in connection with Shakira's case. He was already in custody for weeks on an unrelated charge. Investigators linked Shakira's blood to Hines because he lived two doors down from where the girl was last seen. And it was two days after being arrested that prosecutors actually charged him with one count of aggravated murder and one count of kidnapping. And they even said that he would face the death penalty. Three days after that, more than 100 people rallied at a march for Shakira in front of the home of Daniel Hines. Friends and members of the Hines family actually said that the march threatened the family's safety. But activists say they marched to call for residents to fight crime and warn people not to attack the Hines family or home. But as quickly as our justice system moves, it wouldn't be until 2004 when the next phase of the trial began. But it really didn't. Because it wasn't until July 19th when Common Pleas Court Judge Thomas Picorni ruled two key pieces of evidence against Hines wouldn't actually be allowed at trial. And that was the testimony of a dog handler and information about past allegations regarding the molestation of two girls. 
In July 2004, a small ceremony was held for a donated grave marker in Lakeview Cemetery to honor Shakira. And I'm going to reference a few things here from an article by James McCarthy of The Plain Dealer. Again, Cleveland's only newspaper. And McCarthy's article states, Cuyahoga County Prosecutor Bill Mason said the evidence that he has collected would conclusively link Daniel Hines to the kidnapping and murder of 11-year-old Shakira Johnson. Searches of Hines' basement room in his mother's east side home and of the site where Shakira's body was found turned up other compelling evidence, Mason said. He bullet pointed a couple things, one being her blood was found on a glove in Hines' room. Another one was a fiber found near her body matched one that was found in the upholstery in Hines' van. And another one was a trash bag found near the body had come from a roll of bags that detectives found in Hines' room. And the tear marks matched up perfectly with the one at the scene. It was only a few hours after a grand jury had indicted Hines on these charges that Mason had mentioned that he was going to put Hines to death. Mason believed this was one of those cases that grips an entire community and deserves to be put to death. Heinz's lawyer, on the other hand, denied the evidence implicated his client. Heinz's mother, sister, and brother shared a home, and he said that visitors have come and gone, and there was just no way that he could have committed this crime. Now, everyone here, or listening, is familiar with Luminol. So, according to Mason, on October 26, police treated Heinz's room with Luminol. And, you know, this chemical is the one that's used to show blood stains. And the test actually turned up blood residue and splatter on the walls. We've all seen cases solved with fiber testing, and in some cases, it's better than others. For example, the Atlanta child killer was connected to his victims due to fiber evidence. His case was unique, though, because only 80 houses in the whole city of Atlanta were actually outfitted with this type of carpet. Fortunately, this carpet was actually in Wayne Williams' home, and that is what they were able to use in order to prosecute him and hold him accountable for the child killings. Now, since then, there has been some questions raised about the validity of this science, but at that time, and still to this day, it is still considered a reputable way of determining somebody's innocence or guilt. So investigators said at the time they were analyzing more than 100 different pieces of evidence. As I mentioned before, police convinced a judge to bring Hines in and revoke his bond over an unrelated molestation charge. He had been accused by a family relative of molesting them, and the police actually were able to convince this judge to bring him in and revoke the bond. So police now had their first chance to search his van. And after the discovery of the body, police twice searched Hines' home at East 106th Street, as well as his car and van. And for this reason, forensic experts working for opposing sides in the murder investigation each concluded that the man charged with killing Shakira probably was in jail on the day that the 11-year-old girl died. As I mentioned before... Forensic entomology was a new way of testing back in 2003, and it was an investigative field of science that gathers critical clues from insects. Heinz's lawyers had hired Neil Haskell, who was a professor at St. Joseph's College in Indiana and was among the nation's leading forensic entomologists. While the state hired Joe Kuiper of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, the prosecution was hit with a huge blow when both reports cast doubt on the theory of how Shakira had died. In court documents, police and prosecutors said Shakira was most likely killed September 15th and her body kept hidden in a plastic trash bag until she was found in a field on October 15th. It sounds like an interesting theory, but it may just be a little too hard to comprehend. How did he do this with nobody smelling a rotting corpse? So on that note, I will be back with part two 
next week as we take a deep dive into the trial and what it's been referred to as the Cleveland OJ. I will also speak with Levon Putney, who I worked with on this case back when I was just an intern. So thank you again so much for tuning in this week. This case is technically unsolved, but if you have any new information, the time to share it is now. Don't hesitate to contact the authorities if you saw anything on the day that Shakira went missing. Anyone with information can call the Cleveland FBI at 216-522-1400. The Cleveland police can be reached at 216-623-5400. Or you can always reach Crime Stoppers at 216-252-7463. And everybody remember, tipsters can remain anonymous. If you do enjoy this independently produced podcast, you can help support the show and independent journalism by clicking on the donate button on whokilledamymahalovic.com. Any amount is appreciated and it really does help keep this show running. So if you do enjoy the show, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts because even that will help get this show the attention that it actually deserves. So thank you again for listening this week. Stay tuned for part two next week. And for all my listeners, be safe. Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman. Are you tired of seeing your teen or young adult struggle on a path that clearly isn't the right fit? Is your teenager confused about which direction to take after high school? The future of work is changing rapidly. And our kids need to know all of the options available after high school so they're empowered to make the choice that is best for them. In each episode, we explore the latest trends that are shaping the opportunities of today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Betsy Jewell, and this is the High School Hamster Wheel Podcast.